everyone. Welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton senior Tiger Gao. My guest today is Professor Katarina Pistor. She is uh, the Edwin B. Parker Professor of Comparative Law and the Director of the Center on Global Legal Transformation at Columbia University. Her most recent book, which I have here on my hand, uh, The Code of Capital, How the Law Creates Wealth and Inequality, examines how assets such as land, private debt, business organizations, or knowledge are transformed into capital through contract law, property rights, collateral law, uh, and trust, corporate, and bankruptcy law. Uh, it is named as one of the best books uh, of 2019 by the Financial Times and Business Insider. Uh, she is a leading scholar and writer on corporate finance, money and finance, uh, comparative law, and legal institutions. So thank you so much uh, for joining me today, Professor Pistor. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, so as we have seen in the past year or two, there is really no shortage of books explaining issues of inequality. Uh, but as your preface uh, really pointed out, I, most of those books really fail to address a more fundamental question about the genesis of capital, which is how is wealth created in the first place and therefore relatedly, uh, why does capital often survive economic cycles and shocks that leave so many others adrift uh, deprived of the gains that they had made earlier? And I think this is the central question that this book is trying to answer. And, and your book makes so many interesting arguments about the relationship between capital and law and how this impact uh, has on, on, on inequality. But would you mind just first telling us a little bit more about some of the most uh, central arguments to your book? Yeah, of course. I'm happy to do that. So I do address the question, you know, where does wealth come from, really? Because uh, one of the things that we do observe is sort of this dis discrepancy in, in wealth um, in, in, in the world, and uh, especially also within countries, including the most developed, uh, advanced countries, as they're sometimes called. And I'm basically asking, okay, so where does wealth come from, and where does capital that basically embodies um, assets that produce wealth or can also protect wealth that has been generated in the past? And my answer to that question is really we have to unpack um, the assets and we have to look through the epiphenomena basically when you look at a piece of land it's just really a piece of dirt um, and there might be some cultural value to it there might be some value in, in you know in, in walking across it and, and enjoying its beauty but if you want to monetize land you need something else you need to make sure that somebody who wants to monetize that land can enforce that claim against others so you're creating basically uh, a rank uh, so you're ranking different types of claims to the same object and you can um, say the same about other things so if you take any object any promise to future payment or any idea or know-how we can flip it into a capital asset i argue by grafting certain legal protections onto them. What we're effectively doing is we're harnessing the powers of the state to organize the relations to these claims in such a way that somebody has a stronger claim, somebody has a weaker claim, somebody can extend the claim in time, which I call durability, all of the way knowing that these claims are enforceable against anybody who comes along. And that universality can be provided only by basically the social good that we call law, backed by the enforcement powers of the state. So capital really, I'm saying, is, um, is uh, a set of attributes, or, or legal attributes that have been grafted onto different types of assets. And only this grafting process turns a simple object, a simple promise to pay, a simple um, idea into a capital asset. Uh, so I listened to many of your public talks, and, and when I read the book, one of the first things you did, what, as you always do, is to define the term capital, uh, w which is really of central importance to the idea of code and how the code is enabling capital. So would you mind telling us a little bit more about how you define the term capital uh, and also maybe how you define code? Yeah, so uh, capital is basically uh, an object or thing, an asset more generally, that can create and protect wealth for its holder, right? And that's not something that is happening naturally, but it's a social relation as Marx correctly suggested, but it's a social relation of a certain kind. And I'm basically saying it's a triangulated relation. It never only um, involves the asset and the asset holder. It always involves the social resource that we call law. And the law works because it is backed by the enforcement powers of a state. 
because you wrote that uh, what makes the concepts of capital and capitalism so confusing is that the outward appearance of capital has changed dramatically over time, as have the social relations that underpin it. Uh, so maybe I could superficially understand or interpret uh, social relations or, or law as uh, the rule book or the playbook that dictates how capital uh, and asset holders and all interact with each other. But I think it's much more easier for one to understand the physical and intangible representations of capital, but much harder to realize that the social relations that underpin it. So would you mind just telling us a little bit more about the social relations, uh, this rule book, and, and how the relations have transformed over the years? Yeah, so I use the term code because I want to allude to the fact that what we have to understand is really that behind the piece of land and behind a promise to payment is a particular um, coding of social relations, right? It's like, um, it's like the genetic code that we don't see, but we know that the genetic code basically determines to a large extent what things look like, how they look like, or the source code of a particular software code will program how things come out. Um, I would not go as far as saying dictate because you can use the same modules as I call these different legal institutions in different ways and can generate, you can generate different types of outcomes with them. But if you want to strategically use them to generate wealth for a particular asset holder, you can do this and you can do this in a highly flexible way. So I think there are two things that really, especially if you come from economics or social sciences, you have to realize is that the outward appearance of a piece of land doesn't tell you who owns it and what he can do with it, whether you can um, uh, create a mortgage on it or something. Something else has to happen for that, right? And so if we look simply at data, as you, for example, Thomas Piketty presented the data in his first book, um, the first major book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, where he shows that rural land was the most important source of wealth until the end of the 19th century. And then something in England, many other industrialized countries as well. And then something happened and it no longer was. And as a good economist explains it by changes in supply and demand and techno technological change. And I'm basically arguing if you don't understand that we use the same legal institutions that have been used since feudal times to code land as capital, that we use the same type of devices now to use to code financial assets, know-how of firms as, as capital, you can't possibly fully understand the metamorphosis of capital that has taken place at the time. Would you mind just telling us a little bit more about the process of actually coding uh, something tangible uh, like a piece of land? Because I remember you writing in the book, that it's, it's not just a matter of supply and demand. It is not even just a matter of coding. It is a matter of the right coding. It has to be have a certain a number of properties from convertibility to universality and, and such and so on. Okay, so I'm basically um, summarizing the core attributes of capital um, as four, um, and I'm saying you need three out of four to flip a simple claim or a simple object or an idea into a capital that is a wealth generating asset. Uh, the first one is priority. And I, I alluded to that earlier when I said somebody has better rights and somebody has weaker rights, right? We are ranking, you're creating priority rights for some. So an owner who owns an object, a car, a motorcycle, a cow, a piece of land, basically can determine how to use that particular object um, and can exclude others um, from using it. We can finagle with that and can you know, um, subject the, the owner to certain constraints, but by and large, that's what, what ownership does. It creates priority rights. Collateral law does that too, because it gives a creditor who has an asset that backs a particular claim, the ability to enforce against that asset, to seize that asset from the debtor and enforce against it as well. So creating legal claims, right? So that's priority. The second important attribute is durability, which means that we can extend our interest to a particular asset in time and protect it against too many competing claims. So I always like to show this, um, uh, you know, with respect to bankruptcy is always a good case to show when you have um, an interest in, a, in a, you have a claim against a debtor and the debtor defaults. Can you enforce that claim against the debtor, right? That's basically, you know, when, when, when you have to put your cards on the table and say, how does it work out? If you have a priority right, you can pull out your asset and all other creditors have to stand by and yield and have to allow you to pull out this asset. But you have to show that you have title. If the debtor has transferred some of his own assets to a trust or a corporate entity, 
I, as a personal creditor to this debtor, cannot touch these assets because these assets now belong to a different entity. It's a legal fiction, a trust or a corporate entity. But the, legal, the law now protects these assets as being owned by something else, even if the debtor is the ultimate owner or settler of that entity, I can't immediately put my hands on these assets. And by therefore, tran therefore by transferring these assets from his own pool of assets to a trust or the corporate entity, it can basically guarantee the, the longevity of these assets behind the legal veil that is a trust. So that's durability. Universality means, uh, what I also just said, is that all other creditors have to yield. Well, why would they? They might not even know, right, that somebody has entered into a different type of transaction. Somebody else got a collateral law. Somebody else has a property rights in these assets. Some assets have been transferred to a trust. They might come from a different jurisdiction where there is no trust law, for example. But the state, that's what universality is all about, will make sure that the kind of entitlements that we have created will be enforceable against anybody, whether or not that person was part of the deal. So in simple bilateral contractual relationships, we're typically saying you cannot impose a burden on others who are not part, of, part to this transaction. But what the law does all the time, and so that's the big question, when should it be doing that? But what it does, if you can claim something as a property right, or you have a particular legal device, such as a trust or a co corporation, you can invoke the powers of this legal institution against anybody. And then last but not least, I'm talking about convertibility, which is really the way in which financial assets, which themselves are creatures of the law, right? Um, how financial assets attain durability is basically by an option to convert an asset that might use, lose its nominal value in a crisis into an asset that can hold its nominal value. So basically the option to convert your asset into ideally cash, legal tender by a country that can back its own currency. Um, and so, so these are the four attributes. And I'm basically saying like for land, you want to have durability, priority and universality. Financial, for financial assets, you want to have priority and universality and convertibility rather than durability. So you can, you can exchange some of these attributes, but that's basically how it works. It's, it's just amazing how elaborate these uh, things are, but also how uh, concise you've summarized them. I, I guess maybe one example that we can give is the example of the Lehman Brothers, which is, I, I think it's, I didn't per previously not realize uh, how elaborate the, 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 the legal structure of the company is because it is not just a company, it is a holding company with over 200 subsidiaries and thousands of special purpose vehicles, SPVs, and, and therefore, um, when Lehman Brothers was about to fail, the government had no choice to bail it out, and there were other, all kinds of financial and legal implications of, of that case. Uh, would you mind just telling us a, a little bit more about that legal structure, for example? Yeah, I mean, there are lots of stories that you can tell about Lehman, <laughs> of course. And I don't think that the complexity alone meant that the company had to be rescued. But I think its interdependence with so many other financial actors in the world um, suggested to the Fed, at least, that uh, it shouldn't let it go. Uh, but it did, right? At first, it, you know, they tried to postpone it, but they did let it go because they, at some, to some expo um, extent, arguably also underestimated the interdependency. Um, so I think... Uh, uh, um, uh, Lehman is so interesting because when you look through its structure, you see that they pursued a particular financing strategy by exploiting the corporate form to make it easier to obtain debt finance. And so the corporate form that has been invented, if you want, or used, justified in the 19th century, mostly as a device to ensure that we have broad, a broad capital base, to have many investors put some cash into a venture, into a, a, a new undertaking so we can industrialize and take risk and build railroads and do, do all these kinds of things. When you look at contemporary corporate structures, you see that the um, idea of having a separate legal entity is being used mostly as a financing device not so much as a you know for doing major productions and uh, so what i'm arguing is that lehman with its 200 registered subsidiaries and many other spvs and by the way spvs is a colloquial term that is used in finance what is an spv it can be legally speaking a trust a common law trust which has particular legal features it can also be corporations. So if you look behind the SPVs, they have particular legal structures and we use these structures for a purpose, mostly by separating different asset pools. 
right? So Lehman Brothers had was incorporated in Delaware, the holding company had had over 60 subsidiaries in Delaware. Why would you do that? Why would you do this? Now people say that you know, Delaware has great shelter protection, but then you have one company, you don't have 60. So what they were basically doing is they were trying to um, uh, protect different entities from one another as, as all these entities are taking, were taking a lot of risk. So they raised debt finance separately for new financing projects, to put it simply. And the question is why would creditors give money to a subsidiary? right that has you know no assets really of its own um, uh, and they did this sometimes reluctantly but they did this in the end because the holding company personally guaranteed the debt of these subsidiaries so to the outside world they say you know you're lending to a subsidiary but really the holding company is standing behind that but the only assets that the holding company had were actually the assets in all its subsidiaries <laughs> So there, you know, you, you can see it's a little bit of a Ponzi scheme kind of thing. Loss, um, yes, and the holding company basically waived its limited liability privileges that the corporation typically gets you. But the critical stakeholders in this game that never waived limited liability were the shareholders of the holding company. So they benefit because they get high returns as long as creditors are willing to lend to these subsidiaries and the subsidiaries do something and then the profits always go back to the center, right? We learned this in bankruptcy when the London entity just, just funneled a lot of money back to the mothership in the US. Um, they had done this all the time. So they treated the Lehman operations globally as a single economic entity, but it was separated legally in all these different entities so that you can do these, you could play these financial games. And that created a lot of wealth in the short term, which the shareholders of the holding company siphoned off by basically um, either selling their assets or getting share repurchase programs or getting dividends. And so they, they, they made a lot of money before the whole thing crashed. So you, you, you used the word epiphenomenon at the beginning of the interview. Uh, I, I think this is perhaps a very metaphysical question, but uh, h how do you view these things from a more, whether political, theor theoretical or, or philosophical point of view? Because one could say, uh, whether it's uh, creative destruction or uh, the art of corporate finance, I mean, this, this is really kind of the, the pure best kind of example, epitome of uh, a capitalism where because individual subsidiaries, you won't be able to get, you know, as cheap of a, a debt financing. So you bundle them together. You use those, you use those elaborate uh, legal structures and complex financial instruments to eventually bind them together, and then you are able to achieve a great efficiency, whether in Wall Street or beyond. Uh, and that could fuel economic growth for generations to come, even though eventually it kind of uh, collapsed. But had it not collapsed, wouldn't this be a wonderful innovation? You know, it's still going on. What I described in Lehman, everybody else had done as well, right? So why did Lehman collapse? Because the government allowed it to collapse. All the other banks were rescued. Um, and of course, because the, uh, the central bank in this country, the Federal Reserve has always helped um, even entities that were ne not necessarily um, uh, subject to oversight and paid their dues in advance, they got the liquidity support that they needed in terms of crisis. And we've just seen this again on a much more expanded um, level, even in, in this in, in this type of crisis. So this 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 works, right? This works because um, um, the private actors who are structuring these organizations and these features are harnessing essentially the powers of the state, our collective good the law and the enforcement capacity behind the law for private wealth purposes, right? And they're doing this in a highly sophisticated way nowadays. So I think um, in, in a way, if you think this through philosophically and theoretically, we have to rethink our theories of the state, our statehood and state power, because state power can be harnessed and used in so many different ways. And we always think of the state as sort of an entity, a person that is, has the power to dictate to others what to do or set the rules for others. In fact, we have made it so easy for sophisticated parties to harness on their own and um, state power, and not only the powers of one state, but the powers of multiple states to put these things together.
just go back to Lehman, I said 60 subsidiaries in Delaware, but also over 30 or so in the UK, over 30 or more, I don't remember exactly the numbers anymore, I have to look in my book, in the Cayman Islands, a couple in, you know, continental Europe, a couple in Australia, a couple in Japan. So these were multiple jurisdictions and they placed these different subsidiaries into jurisdictions, again, for particular types of purposes and used other sophisticated legal devices to, um, um, arranged transactions between them. I have a wonderful example there of how they did repo transaction between entities that were regulated by the Europeans and that were not so that they could arbitrage around the European regulation. So for the private coders of capital and the asset holders, the legal system is really one of multiple systems that they can employ for their own benefit. And they have to make sure that they do this in such a way that they don't openly breach the law because then it doesn't work because they have to harness the enforcement powers. But at the same time, they might very often be breaching the spirit of what these laws are all about, to facilitate investment, to create transparency, to create entitlements. That's really what it's all about, but also sometimes to set constraints. And the art of cap coding capital is really to um, arbitrage around the most costly constraints and harness in the best way feasible the enforcement powers of the state for private gain. You mentioned the example of Lehman's very beautiful uh, repo transaction, and, and that reminded me of uh, the book Crashed uh, uh, by Professor Adam Tooze, who really wrote about how um, the 2008 financial crisis was in many ways a macro financial phenomenon uh, that, that was inherently tied by those international corporations and, and financial institutions' balance sheets that mapped across uh, transatlantic um, in, in that kind of a manner, and therefore brought down Europe together uh, as when it brought down the United States. And perhaps we can go a little bit deeper into this because really since the 1980s, we saw this elaborate boom of financialization. And would you say that we also saw, uh, along with the boom of financialization or globalization, a metamorphosis of how legal code worked? Uh, yeah. In this, yeah. yeah, of course. I mean, the globalization of capital is a legal phenomenon. Yes. Capital is, so once you say capital is a legal phenomenon, once you realize that every financial asset is essentially an IOU, it just says the conditions, right? Or harnesses certain types of powers. You can have it collateralized or you can have it not collateralized. So you can have other contingencies built into that. But every financial asset is a claim to get something from you. And if it's just a promise, it's not worth anything and you cannot trade it. In order to make it tradable and scale it to size, including global size, you have to, make you have to ensure a buyer that somehow this empty promise is worth something. And that have, we have done at least in the past and still for most assets, we still do this by basically saying, actually, it is enforceable. So a couple of things happened in the 1980s. Um, countries dropped their capital controls, which basically would say, what kind of, for what kind of assets can you bring foreign currencies to my country? What can you do with the foreign currency when you convert it and, and invest it in my country? Can you just you know, do a real investment or can you buy portfolios, um, you know, investments, or can you buy um, uh, financial assets, basically. And once you open that, and this is a legal rule, right, what you can do with the currency that you bring. The currency itself is a legal institution, right? Christine de Sun <laughs> has taught us that and others have. Um, so once you put this all together, then of course, this whole globalization is a legal phenomenon and would not exist without that. And it happens at multiple levels. Again, it happens at the level of states saying we will open our borders to capital flow. So we drop our capital controls that were in place before. And at the same time, the private players then realize that they can use multiple legal systems and different devices from those legal systems to fashion new entities, to fashion new types of financial assets, and thereby expand their reach. But it reaches only as far as these legal institutions go. In places where you can't use them, you won't see an integration into the financial markets that we have. It is legally constructed. It's choices that are being made by multiple people. It's not a grand design. I, I think it's much more chaotic than that, but it's basically um, in, you know, infused with law and infused with power for that reason. Perhaps we can talk a little bit more about the legal structure itself. Uh, per, this is a, probably a, another metaphysical question for you, a very grand one. Uh, do, do you think uh, that the fact that the current status quo of legal structure engenders inequality or how it's uh, exploited by some of the rich. Uh, do, do you think that that is 
coded in the law itself? Or, or is it that the wealthy uh, or some bad actors have access to lawyers who can find creative solutions to work around the law and, and simply found some loopholes? Well, I think it's both. Um, uh, I think, you know, it's, to some extent, it's inherent to a legal system where we actually are saying we don't want to regulate only centrally, but we want to actually give private parties the power to organize their own horizontal relationship with one another by using legal devices. So a contract, you know, could be just a private agreement and we don't know whether we can enforce it or not. We might have private arbiters. If you want to con scale contractual relationships to create national, even global markets, you have to make sure that those pe people who contract are know that what they contract about will be recognized by others and might be enforceable. So for that, you need the law. And so the, the law has basically made it easier for private parties to use contractual devices. And then over time has also made it easier to use other devices such as corporate law, collateral law, the trust, even property law, basically to pick and choose the, choose the law that they want to be governed by. So once you introduce private law institutions, I think you are empowering private parties to do this. And, you know, this is nothing new. The institutionalists and the realists of the 1920s and 1930s have, have said that, right? Um, uh, Morris Cohen has basically said we have these, these captains of industry that are receiving the delegation by the state to do what they're doing. They have delegated rights. What I am basically arguing is that over time, these delegated rights have become increasingly autonomous because sophisticated lawyers in particular and a greater uh, relaxation of rules and uh, the policing powers of the state have enabled private parties to really uh, make much more out of that, right? And it's not only deregulation, it's also the empowerment of private parties to have greater say over what they want to do. Take the example of corporations, right? The corporation is a legal creature. It was governed at the outset always by the territory, by the country that where the legal creature was set up. But over time, some jurisdictions have said, well, we don't care where you operate and we don't care where you were created. As long as you were following the rules of the jurisdiction of your choice, we will recognize you as a legal person with all the bells and whistles a legal person has. Once you say that, then as a founder of that company, you can go anywhere where you get the corporate law that is to your liking and bring it everywhere where it will be recognized. And you're setting the stage for regulatory competition that makes it harder for polities to counter and say, well, we don't really like this. We don't really like that. Or we think that corporations should also follow certain, certain social objectives. For example, in Germany, we impose co-determination, right? Um, once you allow corporations to pick and choose the laws that they wish to govern by, it's very hard, if not impossible, to impose these rules as a polity. Perhaps we can talk a little bit about the solutions to this structure because I, hearing from what you just said, I don't think you are someone who just says, oh, it's, it's impossible to, to regulate them and it's impossible to create solutions because, uh, if, for example, on, on issues like tax avoidances, a lot of people would initially perceive the issue to be, oh, that you can always move the money to Caymans and the Americans can never do anything. But there are a lot of scholars who have come out and said, no, there are realistic ways and policies we can implement. So what would be, well, I'm not a legal scholar, so I feel very, uh, it's, a very it's a big shame that I couldn't ask you on more deeply legal questions, but what would be your legal solution to some of those issues? You know, I think what typically, typically happens is that uh, we have this debate about which countries or jurisdictions we want to blacklist about, you know, being uh, these tax havens, whether it's the Cayman Islands or Cyprus or maybe Luxembourg and the Netherlands or Ireland in, in Europe. Um, uh, and, and, and on the other hand, I'm also saying, you know, what you could also do is just deny legal entity status to the creatures that have been created there, right? So we basically scale back the, our willingness to recognize just any corporation, wherever it's incorporated, even if it has, has no meaningful board of directors. It's the same board of directors in the Cayman Island for dozens, if not hundreds of companies. Um, no meaningful employees. It has no real operations. It's just a haven to shift accounts to no physical things ever move, right? Other than just accounts so we get tax haven status. And I don't really see why we should recognize these things, these legal creatures. These are, you know, 
creatures of the law. And I think we can also say, well, we just won't recognize them. Some tax, um, uh, some jurisdictions are more aggressive in looking through this and will not recognize just everything, but others are less so. And I think we shouldn't only go after the tax havens themselves, but we should maybe sanction the legal structures that they use if they have no function other than to evade taxes. Before I ask you more metaphysical questions uh, about uh, system design, I, I think maybe I would love to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on inequality and, and the trend of financialization that we've been seeing um, at the very beginning of the book when you explained concepts around capital and capitalism, you cited two scholars, uh, two Karl, one is Karl Marx, the other is Karl uh, Polanyi. Uh, <laughs> Marx explained the commodification process of goods and labor, while Polanyi uh, disagreed with Marx about classifying them as commodities. And uh, you, you talked about, you, you contrasted those two scholars to provide your uh, definition of capital. I would love to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on, on how you view uh, those two scholars' contribution and influence on the way we have perceived capital and money? Yeah, it's a big question. I mean, I, I can say a little, bit, a little bit about how they have maybe influenced my thinking. So I think Karl Marx certainly was right. Um, and I don't think Polanyi disputes this, that uh, capital is a social relation. Uh, Marx very much focused on, um, on, on uh, the capitalist and the owner of the means of production and labor and the extraction of labor and, um, and treated law very much as a superstructure. And I'm basically saying the law is right woven into this relationship between labor and capital and how you uh, code uh, property to the production, the means of production, to the enterprises, the factories. So it determines very much what you can do. There's a flip side to that that I don't discuss in the book, but um, some critics have pointed this out, of course, that I don't say anything really about labor. Um, the reason being is that I'm Contrary to Marx, I'm basically arguing you can benefit from capital even without having to necessarily extract from labor because you can extract from society at large, not a specific group of labor, right? So that's that's how I would sort of differentiate a little bit my take from, um, from that of, of Marx. Polanyi, I think, is right that, um, uh, you know, the question is how much do we empower um, what he calls the market of society or whether we basically um, uh, subordinate society to the market principle. Both, however, society, how we organize society and co complex societies and how we organize mar markets are legally determined to some extent. And that's what, I'm, what, what I, would, I would argue. So the market he describes as being outside the community that otherwise uh, sets the social relationships is also a legal structure and how the community relates to that market, of course, is also legally determined. On the two assets that where Polanyi basically says land and money are, uh, are not commodities, it's sort of a normative claim. And I'm basically saying, you know, you know, you can commodify anything, right? What we commodify is the, is the normative debate about what this is all about, right? And we have commoditized people, humans, that's what slaves are. We still do this with bonded labor, right? So um, in principle, if the state is willing to put its power behind um, uh, a discriminatory, um, uh, ruthless regime and say, we will allow you to use the law to create at least the facade of doing something that's deemed legal or where we can harness the powers of the state. We can do this. We have done this. We're doing this in multiple dimensions. And so I just want to get away from the notion that anything is by its very nature, not a commodity. Um, you know, land, nature as such might not be human made, but we can, you know, we can graft so many, I, you know, things onto land and onto nature, claims to, even claims to air, we're doing, a, we're, we're trading permits to pollute. Um, anything can be commodified with the like right legal devices, whether it ought to, I think that's the question. I think perhaps we can go a little bit deeper in, in Polanyi's, some of his claims, because in his very famous book, The Great Transformation, and even uh, Thomas Piketty wrote about him quite extensively in his book, uh, Capital and Ideology, uh, so that Polanyi's vision is, is where uh, one of uh, social embeddedness, that's what he calls it, in, in which case, uh, whether it's labor markets or wage setting or worker training, all of those issues have to be settled by some kind of social or political negotiation uh, outside the sphere of the market itself. So, and, and when I finished reading your book, I, I think it really shattered some of my previous naive uh, conceptions of the legal system, which is that the legal structure is not one that is objective or, or fair or, or per se. It is one also 
very much under sociopolitical influences where we can say socially embedded. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit, I guess, how you view the, this uh, social embeddedness of the legal system, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think it follows very much from what I said before is, um, you know, if every IOU is basically, you know, backed by the state, or if it's not backed by the state, it's not really worth much, right, then you can see how almost everything that we do in economic relations ultimately is related to the organization of power, the way we institutionalize power and the extent to which we allow private parties to avail themselves of that power to harness that power with or without conditions that we set. The more we allow sophisticated private parties to use their resources to um, basically harness the powers that we call powers of the states for their own interests, the more they can uh, run with that, right? And I think the striking the balance between saying, you know, this is really a social resource, the law, the legal systems, and we want to have a greater say over how coercive powers of the states are actually used for different types of purposes. The more we're trying to do that, the more we would have to roll back the ability of private parties to uh, use the power as they, as they see fit. So ultimately, of course, law, law is deeply related to power. I would not go as far as saying that law is power and uh, or that everything that the law does, you just have to cynically look through it. It's just, you know, it's just, the, you know, the power players behind that. It depends on how we institutionalize the law and it depends on, on the extent to which we allow some to use it, avail themselves of it in a way that is not even apparently a power game, but that is, you know, they simply can claim that it's legal, right? Because they have been able to play the system or to game the system such that everything just looks legal. And I think if we want, if we want to make sure that it, uh, legal institutions are used in a more socially compatible way, then we have to institutionalize access to the centralized power of the state in a different fashion. And I think that's what politics should be all about. How do we create institutions um, and how do we institutionalize the coercive powers of the state that are of the polity? And how much power do we give individuals and single and you know players? And how much um, um, power do we want to give collective decision making on what kind of matters? And here we have to constantly, I think, find to try to strike a new balance, and that has to be um, fought out on normative terms. And I think the shortcut that we've made over the last couple of decades on the age of neoliberalism is to say, well, everything that is efficient looks great, we'll just do it, and somehow things will work out. And I think instead of just claiming efficiency has any value as on itself, we really have to think about the normative underpinnings and have to include um, considerations such as the distribution of wealth and income come and what it means for people living in these uncertain time, um, times not to have the same protections that others benefit from. Perhaps we can talk a little bit more about the normative considerations because one option you offered at the very last chapter of your book uh, was quote-unquote radical markets proposed by Eric Posner and Glenn Weil. Uh, I interviewed Professor Weil when I was a sophomore. I was still very naive. I, I feel like I did not fully grasp the, the, the vision he had. And I think uh, reading your book and, and reading more scholars allowed me to have a much better understanding. But what he is proposing is, is very much doing away with the legal privileges of capital and turning our economic and political system into this radical markets, which you wrote about. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit, I mean, not to, uh, not just about Professor Wiles' uh, yeah. arguments per se, but also other views yeah. you have. So actually, I had a conversation uh, with Glenn Weil, and I think he also wrote some pieces after the book where he tries to, you know, resituate his own thinking about these issues. Uh, he, and he agreed with some of my critique. So I think the point that they're making, and I agree with some of the points that they're making, is that if we entrench with the legal system the allocation of property rights as it is, um, we will, you know, have probably increasing inequality to a point that nothing will move anymore because, you know, people just will hold on to their property rights and amass more. And we entrench this and back this by a legal system. So that makes no, doesn't make so much sense. The alternative that they suggest, however, the radical markets, requires a really powerful state enforcing um, the claim to property just because you have a bit more money to pay for it against any other um, uh, uh, consideration. So they're basically saying our assets are constantly on the auction block. Right, your house, your car, your whatever you own, whenever some, somebody comes along and says, I can bid for it higher and you can't compete with it, you have to let go of it. We have to subject everything to the market principle. This would be Karl Polanyi's 
nightmare, right? It's because everything will be determined exclusively by the prices if there were no other normative considerations. And I think what they also completely underestimate is what kind of a totalitarian state you would need to implement radical markets because you would have to drag the homeowners out of the house <laughs> if somebody comes along and offers a higher price. Not clear that anybody would yield voluntarily. Also not clear whether they would actually start this game with a by first redistribution, re redistributing everything that we have, right? If you start that game with the current um, distribution of wealth, you know exactly how it's going to go, right? That's even worse than what we have with the current protection of property rights. So unless you completely reallocate um, wealth and, and resources right now, and then you can start. And even then I would say, you know, it's just uh, too much weight being put on the pricing mechanism. But unless you do that, I think um, that model cannot possibly produce the results that they normatively, I think, somehow want to produce. Do you think an alternative would be, I guess, a violent disruption of the current order that is a true revolution or short of it, the further erosion of the, the law's legitimacy as means of social ordering, which you wrote in the concluding paragraph of your, of your book? Yeah, my, my real concern is that, uh, you know, we're losing our um, confidence in and the credibility of a social system that has served us quite well for some time. And, and, and maybe there are better ones, I, I just don't know yet. And that system is the law, right? Um, so we have been able to scale social, social and economic relations to the nation state, even to the global state um, level by, by using legal devices. And that works because not only the people who immediately benefit from using them, but everybody else believes that the law has some authority and some credibility. Um, but as Max Weber wrote already, uh, he died 100 years ago, he, um, uh, he, he said, you know, legitimacy is in the eyes of the, the beholder, right? Legitimacy is bestowed on, the, um, uh, on an authority and you can't just dictate it. And so the question is whether people believe that the law has, should have authority is, is a critical one if we want to continue a system that basically uses the institutionalization of state power as the fundamental means of ordering complex social systems at scale. Um, and so my worry is if we um, allow basically, you could call it capture, you can call it the instrumentalization, you can call it sort of the utilization of the legal devices in order to um, produce more wealth for the rich, um, while many others don't have access to this resource, simply because they can no longer afford the lawyers. That has not always been so, but I think the lawyers you know, gained as the capital holders whom they're serving um, improved as well. Um, uh, so then if people stop believing that the law has any kind of legitimacy and authority, then we're losing the glue that holds our entire system together. And we're basically back to raw power, right? Who can protect their own assets, you hire your own private army, your pri private thugs to protect what you have, right? Or we can turn digital, that's of course another issue that we may <laughs> want to discuss, that's sort of the, the new forms of power that are emerging and that might, um, I might eventually re replace the legal code for better or for worse. Yeah, yes, please, that is a perfect transition. <laughs> we should really talk about the, the digital vision because there's, there's been so much buzz about cryptocurrency in the past couple of years. Uh, whether it's in the computer science community from a you know, pure uh, technical point of view or in the political theory community in terms of what this decentralized form of governance may mean. So wh what is your general take on, on uh, that development? So, so I do have a chapter in the book where I ask the question whether the digital code might be the new code and might replace the legal code. And, and, and let's just step back again. You know, when I say, why is the law important? Why is the state important? It's really important in ordering social relations because of the scalability. When we institutionalize centralized power, we can go much further than if we just have a private agreement between the two of us, right? So if we can harness that power for our private relations and even do this extraterritorially because other states will recognize and enforce the arrangements that we have created, then you can actually create global relations based on a domestic law. We can just we have basically bridged these things, right? So that, that's what state the state law has done. Now, the digital code arguably can do this in a much more elegant fashion, right? Because the digital code can be coded by a handful of coders and, and does not know any borders, if you want, you know? Um, what I'm trying to say in the book, um, just, just apart even from the money issues and cryptocurrencies, etc., cetera, um, is that the coders themselves are a little bit the new sovereigns, right? They decide what goes into the code and they also will decide when to go offline 
when to call an emergency, right? This is what Carl Schmidt said, said is sort of we find out who's the sovereign because that's the person who says, you know, the rules no longer apply. You, you declare a state of emergency. So they, they, they claim very often that they're doing this, you know, for better purposes or higher, higher means. Um, and in fact, I think when we look at, at power relations, we can see that they are, that they are calling the shots. And so I'm, I'm mostly concerned with, in the book, with thinking about sort of what are the kind of decisions that they make when they do the, when they create the digital code and are they really truly different from the kind of power battles that we've fought for centuries? And are we just basically giving in to a technology that ultimately replicates power in a way that is also increasingly difficult for us to escape from because we're so dependent on the digital um, coding uh, strategies? Perhaps one example we could specifically dig into is the example uh, you wrote quite extensively about, uh, about uh, the digital autonomous organizations, the DAO, the DAO was a fascinating tale uh, for some of our listeners. If they would like to learn more, they could listen to uh, the podcast episode uh, from, uh, by Eric Weinstein with uh, Vitalik Buterin, who founded uh, Ethereum. And it was, it was just a fascinating tale. Uh, would you mind telling us your uh, perspective on, on what happened, what went down? Yeah, so, you know, I, I said before when we talked about Lehman Brothers that you can use the corporate code, right, to create an, a legal entity, which is also fiction, right? So if we call a legal entity corporation a legal person that can own assets and can contract and soon be sued, that's also fictitious in a way. And now I think the digital coders have said, well, maybe we can create a digital company where we can basically do away with the human factor entirely, or we just, we can code in advance how decision making by the investors takes place. Um, so that they may, might be able to collectively decide what to invest in or not. And, um, and so they were, you know, the idea was to create like these digital autonomous organizations. And I'm sure they will make more progress than they have since the DAO crashed, right? The, the problem with the DAO is that they apparently had a bug in the code and somebody found the bug and was able to um, move a lot of these assets into a, into a side account or into a subsidiary to which um, he had hoped to get access, um, but certainly was then beyond the control of the original founders and investors to the, to the DAO. So um, I think what the example shows is, of course, the limitations of um, the digital power. And one of the fundamental limitations for anybody who is mortal is that we don't have unforeseeable foresight and things don't always turn out as we planned them. And, and we can't really um, uh, prevent any kind of all kinds of bugs and neither can we really uh, prevent fundamental uncertainty. And I think much of the digital coding takes um, that is happening to today is already accommodating this, right? We're creating extra, you know, oracles where human agency comes back in and helps us organize things if we didn't plan them in advance. Um, but I think sort of, again, the question is when do they come in and who decides and how they're being fed back into the system are all decisions that ultimately exert a lot of power over others anybody who uses is now subject to these rules, right? And if the idea of democratic self-governance was that in some ways we can set our own rules by which we want to be governed, we're tossing this out of the window by allowing basically the coders to decide in, you know, in more and more fields in which we operate, um, what counts as a rule, what we are bound by when a third party dispute resolution comes in and, and, and how this will determine the future of our, of our um, actions. I think the DAO example is really a cautionary tale, uh, as you wrote, of coded determinism operating in an unpredictable world, because as you kind of alluded to, uh, it was really interesting because at the end, the coders had two choices. One is to step in, reset the code, you know, return the money to the investors. The other is to let this go on. And then that was the moment when everybody in the community realized, oh, there are a group of people, a co coders, who can yes. actually yes. be in charge of a decentralized organization that was supposed to be fully decentralized no. and not under anybody's control. So in that sense, all the uh, human uh, factors or, or these uh, traditional types of uh, power plays that we've seen for centuries all came back. Yes, you know, I think one, you know, I've, I've, I, I don't know that many coders, but I've met some, and I think, <laughs> and I've read a lot that has been written by by many. There is a so, so you know. Some are cynical for sure, but others also have these social utopias. And I think my, one concern I have is that I think we should teach more um, history and, and um, social sciences in the engineering departments these days. So people have a better understanding of how the world works and, and what power relations are so that you know it, you, you, can, you, know, you, you know them when you see them. 
uh, what about Facebook's Libra? I mean, they, they've unveiled this new cryptocurrency that's supposed to quickly take over the wor world soon. So uh, I, I think you really don't like it. <laughs> no, I didn't like the Libra. And I was very outspoken about this when the Libra came out in June last year. I, I, I wrote an op-ed, which then brought me in front of the um, House Financial Services Committee as an, as an expert witness. Um, you know, I... I don't dislike the idea of having a, a global currency. And the question is always, how do we govern that? And who governs that? Um, what I don't like is a Swiss foundation that is controlled indirectly by a company that has a single controller, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg controls 57% of the voting rights of Facebook. And Facebook was, was only one of multiple founders of the Libra, but you know, set up the Calibra, provided all the manpower, physical capital power, everything, the legal power to set up this entire thing. So we call this in sociology framing power, you know, that's Facebook has, you know, set up the whole thing and then steps back and is one of the many co-founders, fine, you know, you can believe that. <laughs> I have my problems with that. And then on top of that, you're basically creating a, a structure where a small little private foundation uses harnesses again, the powers of multiple states and their financial systems to backstop a new synthetic currency, which is a for-profit currency, right? And the profits go back to the Libra Association, not to the investors in the Libra, right? They don't get any interest, um, but the profits all go back to the founders of the Libra. So, so they're basically using the relatively stable financial system of, let's say, the United States and Germany and a couple of other countries to backstop their new currency, right? And funnel the profits back to the, the founders of the Libra. And I'm just thinking, what is the social value of all that? So of course, being sold that they would address the problem of the many unbanked, I think there are probably better ways of doing that. And, and I'm also questioning the, the, the fact that it's really a sort of a social exercise if you don't give any interest or any assurance to those who are converting their own currencies into the Libra. Now, if you have a really crappy, crappy currency in a country that has hyperinflation or recent episodes of hyperinflation like in Venezuela and Zimbabwe, the Libra might be better than anything you can currently get. But in um, more other settings, you could imagine that there are um, better ways of creating relatively um, stable currencies. And um, on top of that, I would say the very fact that Libra was using this concept of a stable coin by backing its asset with state assets tells you again, you know, how always capital is coded. You always backstop it by harnessing the powers of the state. You're free riding on a social resource and that's basically state power. And I don't see why um, states should allow um, a, a couple of handpicked organizations by Facebook or Mark Zuckerberg to harness the powers of multiple states to create a new financial system that hasn't been fully thought through and um, would not be able to survive on its own would probably require a major bailout down the road. Uh, I was speaking with a very close mentor of mine, Professor uh, Stefan Eich, who is a political theorist at, at Georgetown, and he actually went to the Libra hearing and he, he explained to me how the Libra Foundation is actually registered as a Swiss nonprofit. And if you're a Swiss nonprofit, you're allowed uh, to distribute your profits to your shareholders. So therefore, you can uh, somewhat interpret this thing as a scheme of Mark Zuckerberg printing its own money. Yeah, yeah, I, I think he's right. And, and you know, I just, just again, just to come back to the coding, the fact that a nonprofit foundation can give its founders or, or members the profit, it's a perversion of the idea of a nonprofit organization. And that's, if you read the Swiss code, the civil code, you can't see that. You have to read the case law to understand that. So there's the background to that is a lot of work by sophisticated coders. These are the attorneys or the masters of the code, as I call them, <laughs> who have pushed, yeah, in Switzerland, have pushed the courts to reinterpret a code that says something very different because a nonprofit is supposed to be a nonprofit, right? <laughs> You're not making profit with it. And so that's, you know, that, that just goes to show again. And of course, everybody goes to Switzerland these days to start um, these kind of um, digital <laughs> currencies because they have these coding advantages, of course. The, the, the true mastermind coders behind the, the technical coders, yeah, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, in your article, you wrote uh, the right response to the Libra thread. You explained how the current monetary system is not seen as beneficial to, for everyone but a single framework could make the, the system a little bit more equitable. Uh, what, how do you picture, I guess, um, 
a, a better framework of, of the way we currently yeah no i think um i was actually contacted by some of the um uh, um companies that joined the Libra in creating sort of the, the, the foundation last October and, and they wanted to explain to me why they joined. And, um, and basically one of the arguments which I fully get is that our dollar denominated regime, global monetary regime is not beneficial for everybody, right? So in, in many countries, uh, you might even just be an NGO trying to do good in the world. You can't really get money into the country and spend it on good things because you're subject to so many rules and regulations that emanate from the US financial system that is very, very difficult to comply with. And so the idea was here, actually, we could have a much more um, accessible, broad, maybe more transparent, but certainly sort of accessible financial system with the Libra and that this is really beneficial. So I think more generally, and I think people are discussing this again now is, you know, we have a, uh, we have a monetary system at the global level. Every monetary system that we have created so far is, tends to be highly hierarchical. Right now, the dollar is at the top still. It may not always be. There are debates about that. It's nothing is cast in stone in social life, right? But it has been for several decades since World War II been at the top um, of the monetary system. And the Fed is de facto our global reserve, uh, global central bank, and um, has shown that again, I think, in the crisis of this year, not only 2008, but now again. But it also means that many of the decisions that are being made are being made in light of what is good for the United States, because the Fed can only do stuff that it can justify by its mandate to guard price stability and employment in the US, not in the world. And so it will be very selective in using its powers to help others. It will do that if there is an effect on the United States. So when you look at who got the first swap lines from the Fed in the 2008 crisis, with whom the Fed institutionalized swap lines with other central banks, basically to give them access to dollar liquidity, then you can see that there's a clear hierarchy. It always goes back to the US system. Now, what is good for the US is not necessarily good for everybody. Right. And so, of course, we're going back to debates that we have after, had after World War II, um, again, is whether we should have a global currency that is not controlled by a single power that is collectively controlled, right, through the IMF, what we sh whether we should take basically the deposit uh, rights of the, the special drawing rights at the at the IMF and convert this into a global currency, whether there are alternatives, whether we can create new types of digital currencies that are tr truly global or synthetic types of currencies that are globally governed and managed. These are some pipe dreams, but just to, um, I think, address some of the fundamental problems that we see in the global monetary system is that, you know, power matters, interests matter, and who controls the global currency matters a lot for what happens elsewhere without these people having any say in that. I guess another implication I, I saw from the Libra case was that Facebook said it would create its own court to deal with conflicts pertaining to, to Libra. Well, Facebook tech, um, created its own court um, also for the, uh, I think, first of all, for its own company for dealing with uh, disputes over what kind of information or content moderation and content moderation they, um, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's interesting. I think Facebook and other digital um, companies are making moves that, um, you know, as they're trying to cloak themselves in the attributes of sovereignty, I've, I've said in different contexts. And, and I think they, they do. And what is interesting, and this is where I would go beyond the book, which I finished two years ago, so one continues to learn even after writing a book. Um, you know, I think when, if I think about Facebook, um, given how much data they control and given the not only the value, the monetary value the data can have, but also the power it gives you over social systems and individuals. You know, we're used to states that um, tax us and use the coercive powers to tax us. You could also imagine that, um, you know, an organization that Facebook that controls our data and the data, data of billions of people around the globe could actually backstop its own currency eventually and could actually maintain its own courts because it cannot only use the data to control us also to monetize these data to fund itself right so there's i think there are forms of power emerging 
that could create um, you know new types of attributes of statehood that we'd only begin to think about at this stage and i would say when i finished this book i underestimated this a little bit i've i've written since two articles that address a little bit more how i think about data today but i think we're all still scratching at the surface and trying to understand um, uh, what this will mean for our um, political systems in particular and for our freedoms as, as collectives, but also as individuals. I remember at the uh, book talk at the Trillis Rabinowitz Center that you gave last Monday, you uh, talked about how right now for someone to produce data, for a user to produce data, the, the user actually has no claim to the data itself because under the legal code, you are not technically adding value to it, whereas it's Facebook or, or Google who aggregated those data and has claim to those data and therefore is able to uh, ha have rights to them. So I think there are just so many additional implications to, I guess, new technological innovations or... Well, it's, 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 it's both a new story and it's an old story, right? The landlords, when we enclosed the land in England in the 16th century, the landlords got it because they could create value with it. When the settlers came to North America, they got it because they said, we will actually, we improve the land. Um, knowledge, you get, an, you get a patent when you somehow show that something is useful and economically valuable. So whenever you can make money with it, you're much more likely to get a property right. So we as the producers of our own data, the courts in this country in particular tell you time and again, and, and lawyers have tried it, they've tried torts, they have tried breach of contract, they've tried everything to claim that the data producers have a property right in their data and the courts have struck this down. Case after case after case, you can read that because there's no economic val value in the single data points that we produce. It becomes valuable only when it's aggregate, aggregated and once it's aggregated, then the data companies have put their own labor into that, right? They've improved it, and so they get property rights. And that's the foundation for their huge control over our our data. If we had been able to contest this, if we had been saying able to say, actually some things cannot be appropriated. It's not enough to say, give the property rights to the individual data producers, because we will sell them for a penny to get access to these data platforms or digital platforms. But saying some things can't be appropriated, um, and we have to protect this by, you know, the law um, or the state and, and use our powers to protect this as a collective good rather than an, an individual private good that you can monetize as the tech, big tech companies are doing. I think we could have had a better, a better shot at uh, controlling our future. Again, it goes back to those normative claims. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we've already talked for an hour. I, I uh, don't want to take too much more of your time, but I think maybe a, a very couple quick broad questions one would be that uh, you wrote that in order to change the current system uh, legal reforms would have to be instituted by principals and not just the agents uh, i would love to hear a little bit more of your how you envision the working and, and reforms that we could possibly take in, in the next couple of years yeah, I think, you know, there are a couple of things here, um, you know, many, very often uh, people say we have to, you know, change the regulations and we have to, you know, um, install new reforms, whether it's, you know, financial regulation or new patent laws, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we have to actually do, do sort of both more and less. Um, uh, very often the regulatory reforms come from the top from let's say Congress wants to correct something, but in many cases, uh, sophisticated lawyers will know how to use the code of capital, these private law institutions that you mentioned at the outset, the property rights, collateral law, trust, corporate law, bankruptcy, contract law, to wiggle around them, to create something new that is not exactly affected by these rules and regulations. Not to violate them explicitly, you have to comply with the law, but to get around them. So to the extent that you know, private parties can use these institutions to always free themselves from their reach, um, the ability to simply implement legal reforms from the top will be limited. You know, when they, if they can mute their effects, then it doesn't make much sense to try to again and again. So I think you have to take away the punch ball. You have to think about to what extent the legal system should back all these private devices that the private lawyers are creating on behalf of their clients, recognize and enforce them. Don't we have to limit the extent that you can pick and choose, for example, the laws by which you shall be governed? Should we recognize any corporation that is that is created anywhere in the world under any legal system and give it the kind of legal protection that we would give our own without asking whether it complies with the normative principles that we have. Should we enforce any kind of 
a resolution or a decision by a private arbitration tribunal that is not bound by any laws, just by the contracts before them, and basically allow them to invoke the coercive powers of our courts just before, because we signed some convention in 1958 um, to basically just give the coercive powers to them without ever asking whether these things are compliant with the, with the underlying norms that we have in this society. And, and I know exactly what the counter arguments are. People say, well, you, it's going to be protectionist. People will just invoke this principle of sort of local norms to not allow any kind of contracts, transnational, et cetera. And, you know, both sides would be extreme to say we can't do I, I, we, we should not allow anybody to pick and choose any kind of law for their contracts i wouldn't go that far but neither would i say it should be a private choice to pick and choose the laws if they want to invoke the coercive powers of the state because that is a social good and so we have to have some social decision making power over that so i think we have to rethink and we have to be very strategic about where we want to put our um, our resources to make sure that we really change something. And I think it's just, just changing something at the level of Congress and some rules and regulations won't do the trick. I think we have to roll back the uh, powers of private agents to harness collective state power for their own private benefits to make a real change. You are from Germany. Are there any good practices that we're seeing in Germany in the legal system or like any good innovations that you think the US could learn from maybe? Well, I think um, it's interesting. Um, uh, many people so far at least have argued that Germany and France should learn from the US and the UK, right? Uh, because the common law system has um, been associated with you know, more deeply developed financial markets in particular, not necessarily growth, but certainly better finance. Um, at least most of the studies that were done prior to 2008 have done that. Um, I haven't seen many studies of that kind since, because somehow the comparison of common law and civil law system has lost interest after the common law system failed so spectacularly. Um, but in any event, so I think what the civil law systems, Germany and France do is um, they are policing more carefully the boundaries between contracts and property. And the difference is really, it goes back to the attribute of universality that I mentioned earlier. In contracts, you can contract over all kinds of things. That's perfectly fine. The question is whether as a private party, you can also impose obligations on others as you see fit without the collective having any say on that. And the ground rule that any student of contract law learns, learns anywhere in the world, you cannot impose obligations on third parties in a bilateral contract. So that's not within your power. But by inventing institutions like the trust or by allowing you to pick and choose legal devices from other jurisdictions, you effectively have empowered private parties to impose obligations on others and the others have to yield no matter what. And I think sort of thinking more closely again, how some legal systems um, have, at least in the past, they have also given up of, on some, uh, some of these issues, policed when we actually will allow private parties to invoke state power. And when we will say, actually, you are now imposing so, such costs on others that we want to take a second look at that. That's, I think, what we should be doing. And, you know, some people will call this financial suppression or, you know, um, state tutelage, or they will call it socialism. <laughs> but I think normatively speaking, I would say this is uh, what we should be doing. And I, and I think the civil law systems have done a bit more of that. Um, I was recently in another call where an economist said, you know, why don't we empower everybody in the civil law systems to also create property rights as they see fit? And I think uh, my response was, I think normatively, that's, you know, really the question. And I would you know, I would argue that we probably should not empower them to do so. So I think there is a stronger civil law tradition, but I would say that um, in the context of global competition and globalization and the ability of parties from Germany and France to opt out of their systems and opt into English law or US law, the ability of these systems to hold on to these principles has been er eroding. Uh, you are a professor of law, but you focus on a lot of those financial economic issues. Uh, how did you arrive here? And I think, I, I guess the, the, the other way around, we often don't see, we don't see too many economists uh, working on a lot of normative <laughs> issues. So, so I would love to hear a little bit more of, of your thoughts, your critique for the field of law or, or economics, what you think mm -hmm. future uh, interdisciplinary scholars would need to study and know. So I think um, 
you know, I, I think I, I, I was really able to do a lot of interdisciplinary work in this country. I don't think I could have done as much in Germany where the boundaries between the disciplines are much harsher and where many lawyers in my position, law professors are much more likely to engage in doctrinal analysis rather than these big kind of policy issues that I raise. So I, 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 found, I, I found this kind of really liberating to come to this country and do this. I've also always enjoyed working and sometimes fighting with economists. Um, uh, economists have actually looked at the law a lot. You know, you know, Coase has talked about property rights and, and uh, uh, Demsitz and, and many, you know, and many grant thinkers more recently have seen this empirical study of, of law and legal systems by Laporta et al, which I have critiqued a lot, but I have also learned a lot um, from that. I, I think you put your finger on the right issue is what I think the economists are forgetting is that law is not just a, um, you know, an institutional device that, device that is fixed once and for all by the state. So we allocate property rights and then the market can function. That's just a caricature. What I'm arguing in the book and showing in the book, I think is that property rights are always being invented and reinvented. We're constantly creating new property rights and the extent to which we allow some to create these property rights, that's really the, the, big, the, the big question. Um, and and, uh, and uh, so, so I think what the economists have to learn, or have, we have a guest here, I have a dog just saying hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, sorry <laughs> that, about that. That, that is just, entirely we're, fine. We're, we are, um, this is the extra for our uh, for our, for our viewers of the YouTube. <laughs> we are babysitting a dog from our neighbor, so he just arrived and is very excited. <laughs> this is a wonderful addition, the extra part for, yes, for our okay. listeners. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, I I come down in a second, and then the other thing I just since we are already interrupted, I wanted to just show you what just arrived. I'm not sure whether you can see this. Yes. Yes. This oh, is the Taiwanese, it's, it's the Taiwanese. Amazing. So there's, there's the first, this is the first translation that just, my husband just brought it to me. Wow. The first translation that's come out, it's sort of for Hong Kong and Taiwan. And mainland China, Chinese translations are also underway. And so the, that's now the time that the first translation are coming. So it's, I'm very excited. Look at this. This, this is great. <laughs> so, so my parents could read very soon. So I read yeah. the English version, but they could read the Chinese version now. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, that is one of, I asked you that previous question because I personally, I'm an, an aspiring economist. I, I kind of want to uh, go pursue a PhD in economics, but after reading your book and, and talking to you, uh, maybe I should apply to law school or, or, or study political theory or something. Yeah, I mean, some people do both, right? And, and I think it's actually, I, I, I never got a full PhD in a social science and I a little bit regret that. Um, I, I did my two years as a, in a master's student at the Kennedy School. And so I had some, I, I think I learned to think, to understand how economists think, but I never really mastered all that technologies and I think that could be helpful. At the same time, I think what economists have to learn more is really how to, you know, look at you know, how, how the law really operates, right? And this is what I said before, they just treat law as too flat, as too simple, as too static and don't understand the dynamic evolution of law and legal institutions. And, um, and, and, and the other thing is, and that goes back to what you just said, but the norms. Um, I organized a, a workshop a couple of years ago with Hanoch Dagan from Tel Aviv and, and Eyal Benveniste. We had a famous economist with us, and I'm just not going to name names now, who basically said, we talked about property and sovereignty, parallels and, and, and distinctions. And he, he basically said, in economics, we never ask the questions that you're asking here. Right, we never do, and I think, for if you think about poli political issues and political economy, how can you ask? How can you talk about property rights without asking it about normative questions? Right, who will draw the boundaries of what is a property right? Who can determine this? Who can create a new property right that will be enforced by the state? Who should be able to do that? Right, and that I think that's really um, so. You can study econ um, economics, but then take a class in philosophy or in law on top of that, right? So, so, so we learn to really have an interdisciplinary uh, discussion. We've had a lot of interdisciplinarity in the sense that the economists conquered the world of all neighbor, neighboring disciplines <laughs> and uh, applied their <laughs> skills to them, you know, coding the law and then running statistics are good, fine, but then let's just do the reverse as well. Absolutely. Uh, since the name of our show is Policy Punchline, I just want to ask you at the end, uh, what would your punchline for this interview be? And, and I just to quickly throw on top of that, are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? <laughs> you know, I tend to be an optimistic person. Um, and so I, let me just leave it at that. I, I, I think my, my book ends a little bit more on a gloomy note um, because it's really, I think it's, it's going to be difficult 
to implement change because we have allowed the system to go so far that those who have been able to play it um, have a lot of entrenched power that is difficult to dislodge. And I also fear that after COVID, many of these powers have been reinforced because if um, our help during the COVID crisis has been much more effective for asset holders, um, financial asset holders in particular, than for small ho small households. So we rigidly enforce their legal um, um, constraints and their commitments. We give them some temporal relief, like eviction protection for a couple of more months, but no fundamental relief really. And so I think um, we will have a lot of political struggle ahead of us. So it's difficult to predict how this is going to come out. I hope it can come out in a better way. Where, you know, what, what I would basically say, the punchline for me is that we have to look deep enough into the system and how it has been coded and how it has evolved over time to um, make important and relevant policy choices. It's not enough just to do this at the superficial level. It's not just enough to, to change ideas about certain things or to go back to some of the social democratic ideas of the 1970s. We have to take the system as it has evolved to this day and then really find its soft spots and counter it there, take away some of the power that private parties have harnessed for themselves and make sure that there is better public control over them. That would, would be my advice. Thank you so much, Professor Pastor, for, for the wonderful punchline for this wonderful interview. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. It was a really a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. Wonderful. And this concludes this episode of Policy Punchline. Please uh, go to Amazon or wherever your, your local bookstore may be. Uh, purchase this, uh, The Code of Capital, How the Law Creates Wealth and Inequality. It's just one of the most fascinating uh, books and interviews I've done. Uh, it's just truly so nice to talk to you, Professor Pastor. And, and uh, we also got the extra uh, hint at the, at the last of the part of the interview where if you, are, you speak Chinese, so if you read Chinese, you can go purchase the uh, Taiwanese, uh, Hong Kongese, or, or, or mainland China versions of the book soon. So this concludes this episode. Please follow us on policypunchline.com. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.